then then I then I move into something else which I don't even I don't even know is there even a word for it I don't know this is podkit episode 19 laughed out of the zip code on March 3rd 2016 and now I'm looking to the release of redact js this episode of podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson Brian Mitchell and Ryan Rampersad we have show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk19. Hello. Hi, Hello. everybody. Hello. Is this podcast? I think it's this is podcast. Are you sure? Oops, it's been a month. Has it been a month? <laughs> yeah. About, or a touch over. Judging by the last time I was on Google Hangouts, that was... Um, I believe January thirty first. So yeah, you that's really pretty, use cool. pretty close. Do you really use Google Hangouts that infrequently? I mean, I, do I from only this use it. For, I only use it for the Nexus. Yep. Nice. That's awesome. Well, to be honest, I very rarely use Google Hangouts, and let me tell you why: because nobody else wants to cooperate with me. Aw. Aw. I, I use I use FaceTime. Or like eighty percent of the time, I use Skype to talk to my parents back home. I think I use Snapchat nice. more than Hangouts, and I don't even have a Snapchat account. <laughs> That's but awesome. Use, but but you're on Hangouts right now. Oh, oh darn! No, I'm not. Actually, technically, oh. Paul Horn's on Hangouts. I'm not. Uh, oh, oh. you're eighteen Google accounts. Yeah, turns out. Well, it's it's so good <laughs> uh, for you guys to come back to Podkit. Um, last time we had Max on. Yeah, Hi, that's Max. true. Thanks for coming on. It was yeah, fun. so we have to thank Max for coming on. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. We should do it again sometime. Yeah, yeah. Now that he's I at agree. a startup and doing all sorts of cool stuff that he can't talk about. That's true. That's true. We should have him talk about all of his NDAs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, he all should give us the word count. He gets that, fired. Yeah, that he's hypothetically signed. That. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, some follow up, which is a rare thing. Ooh. Somebody want to read yes, from talk about show, that? Ian. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, he says uh, in regards to last episode that he's actually pretty all right with uh, the uh, three point five millimeter, or as I know it, uh, one eighth inch uh, audio jack going away, as long as Apple adopts uh, USB Type C. He says he wants uh, wired headphones as an option uh, because it's cheaper, more reliable, and doesn't require people to charge yet another device. Which I totally agree. Um, However, I'm kind of a hypocrite in reading this out because right now I'm using Bluetooth headphones to monitor the show, which is probably a poor decision due to latency and um, wasting power and audio quality and a bunch of other concerns. Um, But I ultimately agree uh, with Ian on this, um, even though I love my Bluetooth headphones. Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, it's cheaper to put in a wired connection but that's because 3.5 millimeter is effortless to put in. It's what two cables that that go to both headphone, mm-hmm. you know, magnets from the jack. I mean, it's so effortless. It's it's so analog and cheap. But USB Type C and Lightning, those are really complicated digital interfaces. And I don't know if it would be in the long run actually cheap. You know, you're going to add a twenty five dollar surcharge on top of your your regular headphone cost just because you're going to put that in. Right, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And like the other thing is the only headphones I've seen that have a wired interface that's not um the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack uh usually use well I, I know there are a couple from quarter inch. <laughs> right, that use um uh what is it called that use um lightning I think already yep. some of them from Apple. Mm-hmm. Um but they they've all seemed kind of terribly um unattractive to me from like a a perspective of just like I I don't know why I'd want to use that over the regular old headphone jack. Right. Um, I guess part of that has to do with the the constant controversy over whether or not Apple is able to make a passive adapter for light for lightning to some sort of audio interface that could es- essentially become those two lines directly to the headphone magnets. Um, I don't know. It's, I guess it's only tough. time will tell. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, do you? I guess. Uh, I guess we can talk about later, but. Uh, you know, oh, the small iPhone. So you know, there's there's the small iPhone. So Ian says he dislikes everything about the small iPhone. He thinks that a four inch iPhone is just too small. Although people do indeed have preferences, and the name mm-hmm. suggested, which was I believe the five SE, is that right? That's what it was. Yep. Um, that Not name sure. would literally be the worst. 
it kind of would I, be the worst. I agree. Yeah. And since then, they've and they've updated the name in the rumor format. It's uh, just yeah. iPhone SE. And which so I still think that's the worst name. Is, yeah, it's not that much better. So what do you guys think of when you hear the letters SE? Uh, small, extremely, like we discussed last. Oh, episode. right. <laughs> yes, of course, indeed. Uh, I think special edition, but that's because I have a Macintosh SE thirty, which stands for special edition. Okay. So right. Now, when I hear SE, I go back to my roots, which is Windows 98 SE, which is Windows 98 Second Edition. And I don't want that. It's awful. Good old, leave it to Microsoft to use letters for numbers. Yeah. (laughs) You know how it is. So Ian continues, uh, fixing Twitter. Yes, I hate Twitter as a product. I'm only there because Ryan and Hank Green use it heavily. Well, thank you, Ian. I love you, too. (laughs) Yeah, see, like, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily hate Twitter as a product as much as um, our, our, our friend Ian clearly does, as he wrote in his letter. So I feel okay attributing that to him. Um, be, if only because, like, man, I've been on Twitter for a long time. For, like, I don't know, probably about half my, my adult life, which is weird, a weird thing to say. Um, no, for all of my adult life. Um, I forgot what the definition of that is um but um at, like as a result like a lot of the people that i know in real life uh come from twitter including yeah. but not limited to you folks and you know um, the one of the reasons that's true for us is because we're really technical people and we really like mm-hmm. what twitter does for us right but right. but when you look at it from a different perspective when you maybe aren't as technical or developery or you know whatever it is that we are maybe it isn't as great no, definitely. And there's serious problems with it. Uh, I don't mean to diminish so that in I any have, way. I have my tech account, my main account. I mean, I'm my boss, because mm-hmm. it's an account. So in, in TweetBot on my Mac, I have two windows. So I have my timeline for my tech account and the timeline for my personal account. And mm-hmm. the difference between those timelines are just crazy. You know, people are using hashtags in totally different ways on my personal account and, you know, retweeting things like here. Someone just retweeted Snoop Dogg saying, smoking. I would never see something like that on a tech account. Right. It's, just, it's like light or uh, day and night is such a big difference. And now, I think. Yeah. I guess I have a question to follow that up then. Would you expect to see the Snoop Dogg thing maybe more on Facebook? Um, like, would it be at not, home there? No, because okay. it's a single word and like it was a retweet. So like, I think Facebook, it's more images right now. That's, mm-hmm. that's what I see. Yep. Maybe, maybe a longer, more thought out post. Twitter especially in the personal account is more um, like quick celebrity tweets, um, some memes, um, cross posts from Instagram, mm-hmm. which I did that myself. Um, mm-hmm. What else am I seeing here? You know, a lot of quoting tweets. Here's one quoting a tweet saying, "Ah, yeah. Um, you know, I see replies with more um, informal, th- which I see on tech stuff too. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, more more people's lives and less of you know, the tech tech the tech sphere on Twitter. I think is a little more sheltered, but they're you know they go all out with technical things, but you don't hear as much about people's lives. I think. Yeah, and I so guess they're, right. they're, you hear about lives and more random stuff and more way less formal things mm-hmm. on not tech Twitter. And I guess that's what Peach is for, right? So you know, you you follow somebody for technical stuff on Twitter, and you follow people for their lives on Peach. Right. Peach has right. I have to say, I have to say I haven't even opened the Peach app in over a week. So can um, I delete it now? Is that okay? Yeah, I. Hey, I, we I, all I delete delete it okay. Okay. Got my phone out. Okay. okay I'm gonna scrolling over to it. Okay. Hitting the uninstall button. Goodbye, Peach. Have a good one. All right. Peach is gone. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. X to have the nice gone. <laughs> All right. No. I have to say, I'm I'm gonna open Peach now just just to just to uh, give it one last shot. But you're to... <laughs> oh look, literally nobody has posted anything since you're last on. <laughs> other than yeah, that's funny. Yep. Yeah. Not a single person. Now, how many people on Peach hey, do I... you follow? So I follow oh, no. one, two, three, four, five, like six, Twitter. seven, eight, nine, hundred. 10, 11, oh. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. That is 25 people 
Yeah. On Peach. Okay. Well, that's probably double what I was following. So I've got like three people on Peach. One of those, two of those, both of you and Ian. That's it. <laughs> so see, most that of the people that a pretty sad experience. Yeah. On Peach. I mean, maybe, maybe we're just it, doing it wrong. <laughs> I think at least three of the people I follow on Peach are like um, fake accounts run by Newsweek's amazing Margarita Noriega. Oh, um, right. Of course. Who is, who is their director of social. She is awesome. Super cool person. Mm-hmm. So, um, but she has a lot of fake Peach accounts because back in the day, uh, January ish, that was that was the cool thing to do. Yeah, I so. I guess I uh, missed the boat. I did too. Yeah. Oh God, yes, I totally missed the boat. Mm-hmm. Uh, finally, Ian says that if you get bored running, running, he uh, suggests getting the app called Zombies Run. It's an audio drama that plays as you run and occasionally makes you run faster to be avoid. <laughs> Or to avoid being eaten by zombies, which is very clever. I, I put a link in here so you can download the app for Android and iOS. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. It is very cool. Yes. Um, I have heard from people who've played this game that it is quite cool. And this is especially helpful if you have trouble staying like motivated while running. Um, it's also kind of that... cool to listen to something other than music. You know, you get to um, listen to kind of a story. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, it's like... And, and I guess I should I should say too like one of the things that I I don't really get motivated by the typical people yelling at you to yeah. to no, do things don't so like that kind of narrative no. thing is helpful mm-hmm. it's kind of cool Definitely. for that kind of environment so I think so. more to, I think to just kind of like distract you I don't know I haven't Definitely. run that much I ran a bit for part of spring semester last year and I ran with friends every time so that was but that helps kind of, yeah yeah. yeah. Although, you know, you, you have to watch out when you're running because you don't want to get mugged. So just, just have one headphone in. Yeah. Yep. Although I think if I take up running again, I'll find Bluetooth headphones and just use my watch. And then I don't have mm-hmm. to have anything in my pockets or anything. Definitely. Yep. That's what I do. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. use headphones, though. That would be ludicrous. Yeah, that'd be too big to run in. You, you <laughs> use the little earbud ones, right? The one that has yep. like a cord in the back. Mm-hmm. So I have a set of those but they always fall out so i just i don't know yeah yeah I gotcha. my, my ears are weird at, i guess at some point we should revisit the david pogue um headphones or the david pogue earphones thing which i don't know if it's a thing any longer but um he was well known in like the early 2000s for for being a person who was very finicky about the earphones he would use do you guys remember that at all uh no, they... no too much. I never have really followed David Pope. I only read the outside of the middle eighty five percent he writes. Right, I it's been ages since I've listened to what or since I've read his stuff. But you know, um, ever since he left the New York Times, I don't care anymore. Exactly, exactly. I think this is the one, but I haven't actually read it, so I'm not one hundred percent sure. It's going in the show notes anyway. Yay! Yay! Um, Yay! <laughs> but <laughs> 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 <I'm> enthusiastic. <laughs> He did this thing where he um, he was wondering why no earbuds would stay in his ear, and he had somebody figure like examine his ear, and he was like, "Oh yeah, you're missing a certain um, like structure in your ear that would hold a conventional earbud in," which is just like such a fascinating. That is thing. so bizarre. Of- <clears throat> what, it, what I mean, right. what, a, what a weird thing to discover about yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, I hear you did some fun things over the past week. Yeah, uh, one of them was JavaScript Minnesota, where yeah. um, a really a really interesting and awesome person uh, whose name may or may not be Ryan Rampersad, I was spoiler there. alert, <laughs> it is, um, attended, which was really awesome. I didn't do uh, a talk a or anything, of... although, I mean, you know, I could have, but I didn't. Next time. Next, next time. time. <laughs> I, I started writing it. Next time. Oh, awesome. Yep. So cool. Yeah, I, I think it would should... be really cool if... If you would Record share your stuff about the and things. Yeah, yeah. I, I would love to. Yep. Yeah. So um, there were a couple of really cool talks. One about um, Ec- ECMAScript uh, or ES 2015, I think, and the um, the arrow function um, kind of feature. And there were some really cool, and I thought, kind of interesting questions that came out of that about uh, why you'd want to use an uh, arrow function instead of a regular old anonymous function. Uh, what the debugging implications of that, the answer of which is basically 
there are none. It sounded like um, so or there are minimal. Uh, one, I think one of the debugging questions was anonymous functions typically don't have names. However, with right. traditional JavaScript, you could put a name on an anonymous function, which is kind of funny. But yeah. um, basically, the answer to the question is in modern versions of uh, JavaScript engines, if you're putting the anonymous function onto something that has a name, so a variable or a JavaScript key, I mean a, Java, a JavaScript object key, it will be yeah. given that name implicitly. Right. Yep. Okay. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So that was a really cool talk. You know, you, no, I mean, I can't, I can't have enough ES6 in my life, so. All no, I gotcha. Same. Uh, and then, um, and then we had somebody from Autodesk come in, which is really cool. And he gave a lightning talk about their um, 3D uh, web content kind of visualization framework, which I did some digging into, and it's actually kind of pretty cool. It, it is um, really pretty cool. It is really pretty cool, as Ryan said, <laughs> because um, you can upload basically any document to it, and it will give you a 3D model right back um, as as like a service, right? So you can just upload it. Um, or I don't know, post it to them or whatever. Yeah. And then they will give you a um, a snippet that you can just embed in a page, and it will pull in your model as though it were, you know, as th as though you wrote the darn thing yourself. And much like um, ArcGIS does for maps, you can kind of mess with it, um, mess it, with the yeah. way that the they give you like displays. a little client to manipulate it with a scrubber and a bobber. It's yeah. really yeah. Re really slick cool. and. Um, he didn't get to demo it, but he mentioned a really cool feature that he had the ability to enable. Um, basically, he he enabled something in that document that he had just made, and I think right. he was showing like a little model airplane or something. And then he, when he enabled it, he told he showed a QR code, told everybody who wanted to try it to scan it, and then he told everyone that well, once you scan it and you go to this page. I can be the presenter, so I can rotate the little airplane, zoom in and out of parts, and it will zoom in and out on your phones in real time. Right, right. And that is that so was cool. Amazing. Now, I didn't get yeah. to see it happen, but I believe him, and that sounds amazing. Definitely. That sounds definitely. something like, I was just, Ian posted something on Twitter the other day that was uh, his, his uh, GitHub page for this project he did well in Sweden, and he was syncing stuff, and it kind of reminded right, me. Right, right, right. Are you yeah, saying was, uh, that this sounds like Meteor? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Really cool. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was just going to say it sounds almost exactly like that thing that he shared with us. Yep. Yeah, um, that's that's definitely one of the cool things about uh, a framework like Meteor, um, that which which is what Ian used, not necessarily what the Autodesk folks used. Right. Um, but the the um, the result of that is um, is pretty slick because you can have like um, intra app communication. Yep. Uh, that basically comes for free, mm -hmm. which I will talk more about in T minus like f two minutes. If um, only I had started first... the timer, but you know, I never do that. <laughs> okay. So finally we yeah. had uh, a little section uh, at JavaScript Minnesota about Webpack and mm -hmm. I'm not going to really describe too much about it. It's a, it's a, you know, building tool. It's sort of like browser fi. You can go and read about it on the GitHub. Uh, however, I am not convinced I will continue I to live also. as a Neanderthal with Browserify and Gulp, and I will be happy anyway. Yep, I am one hundred percent with you there. I did not, um, I did not really see how Webpack would help my workflow, um, uh, which was actually what, one of the points of his uh, one of the points of his talk was that there are lots of reasons for which you might not want to use Webpack if you already have a workflow that works really well. And that's true. I don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I will just tell you one more thing. If you go to the GitHub page for this webpack and you look at the first image as you scroll down, you'll see this insane tree of little filey things and it turns into yep. this pretty grid of filey things. And, you know, it's the dream, right? You know, having dependency management pull everything out and organize it in a sane way. Right. <sighs> but it's insane configuration blows me away and I, and I just, I don't, I can't handle it. Yeah. It's, wh where would you rather put the work at? You know, you know, I guess something in this or dealing with a lot of dependencies. And that is a definite concern. You know, if you were in an enterprise class application and you knew how Webpack worked already and you knew you're going to have hundreds of little PNGs spread across your JavaScript layout, yeah, totally. Maybe this is definitely better. 
But, you know, if you're kind of just making a little website or, you know, a little web app that might be a few controllers wide and uh, your your client side is fairly small, maybe you don't. Yeah. Right. Well, that and if you somehow magically work in an enterprise where uh, beta application or where beta frameworks are somehow allowed by your uh, by your enterprise <laughs> architects. Hey, well, um, hey, know- uh, are you sure you're not working at Facebook? That's true. That's true. Because at Facebook, it doesn't matter if it's beta. You can just jump to version 15 and nobody cares. (laughs) That's true. That's true. See, I just know that if I were to, (laughs) if I were to bring that up at at work, I would be uh, perhaps rightfully laughed out of the room, out of the building, out of the zip code. (laughs) But, um, Hey, but at least your dependencies would be in order. Right, right. We have we have other ways to do that. It's called Ant. No, yeah. I'm oh. Ant for Java. No, I'm okay, kidding. Okay, well, tell, tell me about this other thing. Yeah, so um, I went to, over this weekend, uh, on a total whim, uh, I went to Software Weekend for Education, which was taking place over at uh, VidKu headquarters. Yeah, um, I VidQ, saw that. How is VidKu doing? They are doing really well. That's good to uh, hear. From what I can see, because their office still looks really sweet. Um yeah <laughs> i i am um, sad to say that i have uninstalled vidku however i remember them fondly yeah yeah no i i use them occasionally it took me about 30 time. seconds to remember what vidku was <laughs> not I'm a good sorry. sign brian <laughs> that's that's fair but i have to say what one of my uh good friends and former co-workers works at vidku so for these reasons i i've remained in touch with him in part over vidku that's good um also over snapchat but <laughs> The uh, and Peach, he's a, he's a big uh, Peach user. Okay. He was um, until six weeks ago when everyone stopped using Peach. Oops. But uh, that's that's neither here nor there. But um, the anyhow, the point of Startup Weekend DDU is that you can uh, get a bunch of people together. Everyone can anyone who has an idea can pitch it, um, and then anyone who's in attendance can vote on which ideas get selected to form teams around. Um, and a bunch of different people were doing that. But first, I want to call out um, the really awesome uh, organizer, uh, one of the really awesome organizers, uh, which is Experiment on Twitter. Um, he is a very, very, very cool person who I've ran into all the time, um, all, all over town, um, uh, in no small part at uh, Minidemo recently, where a uh, friend of the show, Jake Larson, was dem- demoing his application, Lightjot. Um, and when I ran into him, he said, um, he was like, hey, you should probably go attend this thing. And I was like, what thing? And he was like, this thing. Uh, sent me the link, and I attended, and it was awesome. That is this. Um, anyhow, so a couple of the ideas that got uh, accepted include this really awesome one called Burn the World, um, which is a video game where people, uh, to, to quote the the founders, save the world by destroying it. Um, so it's a it's a Unity game uh, for iOS, and uh, I think they're planning to move to other platforms at some point. But basically, what you do is uh, you want to try and destroy the Earth in the quickest fashion possible using a bunch of ways that contribute to global warming and um, climate change. That's cool. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's kind of really, like that really, really, um, really. epidemic game where you you're the virus. Exactly, pandemic. exactly. Yeah, pandemic, right? Yeah, uh, and seeing their demo and seeing their presentation was really cool. So it was it was cool that they're kind of making it uh, making it a thing from there. And uh, the project that I was working on um, is a meteor app. Uh, we are still kind of in. Um, gosh, this phrase is so silly, but we're kind of in stealth mode. He says really pretentiously, Um, but uh, we're we're not really in stealth mode. We're just not really launched yet. Um, And I worked with a couple of really cool people on it, uh, including uh, a developer and a UX uh, designer slash information architect, uh, both of whom have GitHub profiles and both of them are linked in the show notes. They are very awesome folks. Um, Some of them, uh, I... I, uh, um, we, we all kind of collaborated on uh, designing the technology stack for the app, which is really cool. And at some point, I hope to talk about if this becomes uh, a thing that we focus on in the longer term, which is still kind of up for debate because building a thing in a weekend uh, does not always make uh, a, 
a really awesome thing that you want to do for the long run. Uh, yeah. Certainly when you start doing things like including multiple UI frameworks uh, inadvertently. And yeah, like that. I heard about that. That is uh, something you might not want to do. Right, right. I t- I, it turns out I figured out where that came from. Um, so f- for the listener, um, we decided to use Meteor, uh, Meteor.js, which is a uh, JavaScript web application framework that allows for really easy uh, socketed real-time communication between the server and the client. Uh, you might have you might re- recall it as the one that everyone used to build a really simple, insecure chat application. Yes, um, that one. That's the one I used. Ago. Yep, yep. Um, so I, it's kind of funny because one of, one of the people who's linked here is um, uh, Cody, who is a really uh, awesome web developer who I uh, met um, before we even f- figured out that we were all on the same, that we were going to work together on the same team, um, we had joked about uh, about Meteor uh, because he, he had done some work in Meteor and I'd done some work in Meteor mm-hmm. and uh, I was showing him Coda for iPad and he was like, is that a Meteor project? And I'm like, how did you know? Um, but then when we started working together, we're like, oh, this is too perfect. We have to make this a Meteor project. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it turns turns out some of uh, one of the things that Meteor does, what's part of its full stackishness is that um, uh, a lot of UI elements are kind of incorporated with it. So mm-hmm. if you use a full stack Meteor all the way down and don't try to incorporate on like regular old NPM or node modules, uh, um, you end hmm. up... Uh, you end up doing things like including multiple UI frameworks that you would have never anticipated because why would you think that a, um, say, a uh, forms module, for example, why, why would you think that a, that a database schema add-on that allows you to create forms would include um, Bootstrap along with it? Yeah. I don't know. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, you have experience in hybrid environments now, so... I, I'm pretty sure there'll things. be a conflict, and you cannot hybrid that. Yeah, uh, it, it led to some really interesting consequences. Yeah, but, I can imagine. Um, but it's all it's all good because you know it, that was that was a that was a plugin that I had never ever ever used before with Meteor. I'd only used Meteor kind of cursor cursorishly, sure. um, for that. Yeah, cursory in a cursory fashion. There we go. Words they're they're succeeding me right now. Um, but um, yeah, it was a really cool app, and hopefully, I'll share it with you guys at some point. So, when you use a Meteor app, is it similar to the the uh, to the Node.js kind of style, where you write some servery functions on the mm-hmm. server part, and then you write some client T functions on the client? Is it similar to yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. It is similar. It is similar to that, but there's a, an addition of a weird kind of complicating factor, mm-hmm. and that's that things like routes and. Um, uh, routes and models okay. are actually in what's called the lib directory. Um, so mm-hmm. it's actually shared between server yes, and client. Yes, right, yeah. You know, it's been so long since I have meteored. You know, this I, I was using it after after Ape, App Push Engine, mm-hmm. died, but before it went 1.0. And, you mm-hmm. know, lots really, you know, cemented since then. Definitely, I should, I should definitely. definitely look into this again. I dealt yeah, with and- Meteor for... Maybe three hours one night this summer. Nice. And it was kind of fun, but I was like, "eh, this is uh, this is not the stack that I want for my website." And that that's one of the my hesitations too. You know, that it's a full stack ish kind of thing, yeah. and uh, that that uh, messes with me in the wrong way. So we'll see. Right. I do have to say that I've scoped it out for a project that I want that I've had in the back of my mind for some time now, and I'm hoping it should work out pretty well, but. Um, otherwise I'll go back to, um, happy JS, which is the one that I've been sticking with for a while now as mm-hmm. kind of my non-express JavaScript framework. Yeah. Definitely. I will add one more. I will add one more thing about Meteor and then we can mm-hmm. move on. Uh, and that is that Meteor's kind of command line aesthetic is much more similar to Rails mm-hmm. because of its kind of full stackishness. Yep. So you can do things like Meteor DB console and Meteor shell, mm-hmm. Meteor reset, for example, to yep. clear the database and start fresh. I really so, like yeah. those um, terminal helpers. Um, Laravel yeah. has something very similar to that. It's called Artisan, and it is right. wonderful. Like It is just fantastic to be able to interact with your app on a terminal level rather than just do HTTP. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I definitely agree. Well, uh, well next up. we have here, next up, 
War game benchmarks. This again. Mm-hmm. No, have we ever talked about Woo-hoo. the war game on this show? I'm sure we have, right? Probably. Okay. Yeah. Well, for you who don't know about the war game, uh, it is sort of kind of a benchmark and it, uh, is implemented in a variety of languages that you can probably run on your computer. And, um, this was actually done by me quite a few weeks ago now, and we are just getting around to talking about it now, I guess. And that's fine. So I guess I'll just give you a high level <laughs> overview of what I've learned from making the war game. First, I have moved the war game from my own repos into a GitHub organization repo. I guess that's what they call it. And, mm-hmm. um, GitHub's really cool. You know, you can keep all your history and all your commits and everything you've loved. And you can just move it wherever you want. And it's great. It's really cool. Uh, so everybody should do that. Just move your repos wherever you want them. They'll be happy where they are. Uh, also cool to note, GitHub will also somehow redirect your repos so you don't ever have to update your remotes. Because that would mm-hmm. really suck if you had to. Okay, yep. so language time. So turns out Java, it's not fast, but it's not that slow. It's just barely good enough. Um, one of the cool things about Java is that everybody kind of learns it in their, in their curriculum somewhere along the line. And Mm -hmm. I would argue at this point, Java, just as a syntax, kind of looks like pseudocode. It looks like all the other code I read, but you know, there's nothing that unique about it. You know, it's not, it's Mm -hmm. not strange. It's Java. It's just code. It works. It's plain. Yeah. Um, it's not that slow. It will multi-thread somehow, maybe kind of, um, (laughs) The JVM does require a warm-up, which means you have right. to do your operation some arbitrary number of times to get the pathways hot and the caches primed. But once mm-hmm. that's done, it'll probably be somewhat fast. So in the next version of the war game, and you know there's going to be another one, <laughs> I'll be changing everything again, and I will attempt to mitigate this warm-up factor somehow. Um, nice. I will tell you a problem with Java it says it's run w- w- right once, run anywhere. That's the model, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's only true if everybody's updated their JVM on their computer. And guess who never updates anything, ever? Everyone. Nobody updates. My MacBook Air is still running 7, I think. And, <gasps> I, I, and I know for sure a computer in this house is running 6. And, oh, my gosh. And, see, in my... Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, see, I I can't... I've I have at least two to three work projects where I have to have eight, seven, and six. Yep. Not all in the same project, but for three different projects that uh-huh. I have to do. And I can't update to eight on on my Linux computer because fourteen oh four Ubuntu doesn't have a repo for it or whatever they call it repository. That's, hmm. I don't know. They don't have it, and I can't update it. And so I'm I guess yeah, that's where I am with Java. So let's talk about Go. Oh, gosh. So Go is really great, and I'll tell you why. It feels like you're scripting, but you're writing a language that has a compiler that's really good and that compiles to native code. So there are no semicolons. Mm -hmm. So it's like a modern scripting language. It has a very easygoing syntax. There's no, you, you, if you've ever seen Objective C, it doesn't look like that. (laughs) Never (laughs) used it, Bo. I've seen it. Yeah. So if you've ever seen Objective C, you know, it looks like something is crying inside of your computer i mean it is a, a, a travesty to behold go does yep. not look like that go looks very c-like but it's it's um it's c if it were happy a happy c <laughs> um nice. it does not have the greatest package manager in fact i don't know if it really even has a package manager brian says it does i don't know if i believe brian apparently yeah i and, mean there's something in homebrew that claims to be go dependency manager or whatever they called it yeah so i don't know about so i don't i'm not i'm not uh i'm a developer that traditionally uses dependencies for the web and so i use npm of course but in in this go manager you sort of just fetch git repos and then you put them in either your class path or your project path and then it will pull the code in and compile it whenever you compile your code and I guess that's probably what C would do if C had a package manager, but it's weird. Um, right, right. And finally, uh, well, finally for this part, there's not, it doesn't have the greatest setup. So what you have to do, and this is really weird to me. So 
you know, you, you know how you can open up a JavaScript file in any folder and, you know, run it in Node or uh, run some Ruby code or run some Python code just anywhere? Mm-hmm. Well, Go... It's so, a of, full REPL? Yeah, or, or you can just make a file in your desktop and just run it. You, know, oh, you can do yeah. that. Well, Go kind of forces you not to do that. Go kind of forces you to have this really rigid file structure. You need to have a folder that is mapped to a path in your in your path that's specifically for go called the go path and then inside of that path you need to have a source folder and then a, a github username and then your actual project folder and and it hmm. forces you into this really rigid structure and it's really bizarre that does sound bizarre I mean, I guess it's cool because it kind of sets you up for source control by default and it forces you basically to do it, but yeah. it still messes with me and it's weird. Okay, so about the language, I love types. I mean, yeah, just who doesn't love types? A strongly typed language is worth it no matter where you are. Um, okay, so let's go to Rust now. So uh, Rust is insanely fast. Um, one of the things that I found out was that the threaded um, number generator thing wasn't actually threaded, uh, which means that a, a single thread would create one, and then it would try to synchronize to share it with the other threads. So what I did is I made one for each thread, and the loop just uses the same one over and over again for each game. That's really great, and that made it way faster. So Go isn't so susceptible to this issue because it's slower already, but Rust is so fast that it really did matter that I had a separate desynchronized thing dedicated for each thread. Um, so Rust is really fast, and that means it's really good, right? Well, here's the problem. You will have to fight against it. You'll bang your head against the wall to fight with its compiler semantics. And that's because it forces you to deal with these concepts of borrowing, ownership, and mutability. And so you know how in C, when you pass a reference, or a, not a reference, but you pass a pointer... Well, if you Mm -hmm. pass a pointer from function A to function B, function B could technically free that memory, and then function A might not be aware of that, and it could totally reference it. Well, Mm -hmm. Rust forces you at compile time to not let that happen, but really bad, horrible things happen, and it really sucks. So it might be the fastest language out there, but it's also really hard to write sometimes. Um, So obviously, each of these languages has a strong point. Java's 20 years old. And it's really cool that it's really that old, and it still works. Rust is fairly new, and it's super fast, and that's really cool. And Go is just so easy to write. So, uh, I guess, check out the War Game. You can download binaries for pretty much every platform you can imagine. Um, Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's pretty slick. It's been really cool to see the way that you've been developing it uh, over the years. Yep, years. Um, Many, many years. years. Right? And uh, I feel like that was one of the... The, your work in Java is one of the first things I like talked to you about on Twitter, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think you posted about it. I remember talking to you ages ago. Yep. When you started in high school or something, because it helped you with one point version one point something. Yep. Freshman year of college for me, mm-hmm. and I have one commit on uh, fixing some shell file. Yes, you do. You you fix the batch file to compile something in Java. I I don't uh, I don't know how nice. that works. Java compilation is not my favorite, just so you know. Yeah. Yeah, oh, me neither. We should have an episode about Maven sometime. Maven and Gradle. I have lots of words to say. Good stuff. Maven and Gradle. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Yep, absolutely. What, what are archetypes? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so do you want to talk about Apple versus the FBI? Uh, there's probably some words that, that ought to be said about this on any Apple-related podcast. And that um, is this show. <laughs> And that is that is what we are. We are Apple adjacent, if nothing else. So, um, uh, for those who have living, uh, li- been living under a rock or inside of an encrypted iPhone, and uh, <laughs> 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 uh, well, the story is the FBI has a San Bernardino iPhone that is encrypted, and for some h- horrible reason, they think they should be allowed to uh, force Apple to. Not necessarily make a backdoor, but at least to artificially weaken the encryption uh, breaking procedures. Uh, Basically, they want to turn off the 10 
um, 10 input limit, and they want to take off the exponential time delay limit right. thing. So they can just plug it into a computer and brute force it. In Basically. Because it's only 10,000 options for a four-character passcode. Right. So six now. now, this has been going on for a number of weeks since we haven't had a show. The story has evolved considerably since we first had this breaking news. Um, mm-hmm. One of those key points is that it turns out the passcode that is on the device now isn't even the one the guy had actually set. Turns out right. it's, the password. it's the iCloud password for the Apple account. Right. So somewhere along the line, it. some password was reset, so they can't even use that password now. And uh, the uh, some somebody says the contents of the phone probably won't reveal anything they don't know already because the carriers have already cooperated and the company the guy worked for already uh, had access to his email. So in other and words, the company. Yeah, I was just going to add that the, the company that he um, that he worked for happened to be the county government, the yeah. very county government that, um, yeah, immediately yeah. took custody of and changed the iCloud password related to that phone. And and so this this whole thing is sort of kind of ridiculous. Yep. Long story so short, the uh, government said, "Nope, FBI, you can't do that." So it, it's sort of still ongoing. Uh, I don't think is we've that- seen the last of it. Right. No, I don't think I it's done. Say, but I don't. I don't think it's yeah. done yet. No. Okay. It seems for the most part, though. There, there was uh, a the there was a hearing to. in the Congress, I believe, and the Congress yelled at the FBI director, I believe, pretty heavily. Yeah. I don't have a yeah. link for that. However, it is true. I do. I I'm putting it in the show notes <laughs> presently. Uh, Use me while I mute myself. If uh, if anybody's interested in the idea of encryption and want to know more about that, you have two choices. You can either go somewhere else and read about it yourself, or you can listen to this wonderful episode directed by Ian R. Buck and Ryan M. Rampersad, in which we <laughs> dis, uh, discuss at length how encryption works and why this is an important issue. Um, you know, it's really interesting to um. So I don't have an Apple product, and I certainly don't have a product that, if uh, you know, is encrypted to the degree in which an iPhone is encrypted. Uh, and um, you know, I think it's really cool that uh, people have encryption on their phones that can prevent the FBI from accessing it easily. I really like that. Yeah, it makes me happy that Apple actually could get into a device. Yep. Because you know, they say it's secure, but it's it's good that they're they're willing to take a risk against the government to backup user security and that's not to product. say they didn't cooperate the, uh, I, there was a story maybe in the new york times where the um they told or they told the new york times that they had cooperated with four different methods of how to get into the phone without this backdoor technique so one of the suggestions was well if you take it to a place with wi-fi that it's already been logged into you could have yeah. you you could unlock it easily or, or more easily somehow. That's um, so yeah. you could um, I get an iCloud it'll, backup. Yeah, right. so it'll it'll yeah. plug it in, let it go overnight. It'll it'll automatically backup, and, and that's where the and iCloud then they, password. And then um and then Apple could give yeah. the FBI the iCloud black backup, uh, and they could brute force that all day long. I guess. So yeah, yeah. What a what it's an, been interesting. What an amazing case for me to see. Yeah, it's been interesting for me to see this unfold because i follow a lot of jailbreaker people and ios security researchers and so you know they're all saying it's iphone 5c so this is before touch id before the secure on um secure enclave yep so the security is much weaker um there are dozens of exploits multiple many jailbreaks that have come out in this time depending on what software version is running so especially if it's not the newest one you know there are there are known exploits and vulnerabilities out there that the FBI could have done, which makes me a little happy to, at least publicly, they you know asked Apple to do it rather than just go on their own and hack their way in. Well, what else the NSA is doing? I mean, I think that's one of the most interesting parts of this. It's not as if Apple didn't cooperate, and it's not as if Apple has to do anything. We know for sure the NSA could totally take apart the iPhone, hook it up to some machine thing, and the machine thing would eventually spit out the answer. I mean, that's what the NSA does. Yeah. And it's interesting that they're going this semi coercion legal route. Right. And and instead of just going the totally legitimate, you know, we pay the most expensive people on the planet to do it for us route. Right. 
that's that's one of the things that I found really interesting too, because this this is something that um, the uh, crisis communication and public relations side of my brain uh, is really interested in, because uh, in a lot of ways, like the the relationship between uh, the companies and uh, and the FBI in this case is really like one a, a classic sort of checks and balances sort of thing. Um, I think Syracuse had some great words to say about this on ATP 158. Um, one part of it is, um, of course, that like the the uh, law enforcement can do whatever the heck they want to within their um, within their like domain and the powers given to them by the law and Congress mm-hmm. and uh, the Constitution and all that to um, to uh, break into any iPhone they want, shall we say. But uh, one thing that they can't do is they can't um, outsource that to other people without um, who don't want to do it for them, basically. Right. Um, and that that's one of the things that I found kind of uh, interesting. So I talked with um, a couple of folks, one uh, individual in particular who uh, used to be involved in the national whole national security uh, thing from a communication standpoint, who is a really cool person. Um, and I really think that they have some interesting uh, perspective to bring to this. And one of the things that this person said was that, um, you know, originally it seemed like the narrative was much more about encryption. And that's that's shifted a lot because um, even while well, encryption is still definitely a related topic to this, a lot of what it is is more about like um, checks and balances and um, and really the power behind it instead exactly. of necessarily mm-hmm. the the uh, the actual phone that is um, in uh, uh, an indeterminate state of uh, <laughs> of access, shall we say? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I've talked to uh, a number of uninformed adults uh (laughs) and uh i guess one of the interesting things about talking to these kind of people is you know people like us we're we're on the twitter we following our our good friend daring fireball enthusiast john gruber daily hourly about updates on this story and for the people who don't do that what is their perception of the issue do they even know about the issue and the answer is pretty much no and the terrorists Mm -hmm. shouldn't win (laughs) And yeah, yeah. And, and 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 if you frame, if you frame it like, uh, in a, the reverse way or in a different way, should should Russia be able to force Apple to access all iPhones? They're gonna say no. They did say no. <laughs> should um, should uh, you know, other things that are directly similar, and they're gonna say no. And they did say no. And I guess it's really interesting the framing for this particular topic is such that it's almost impossible to get a normal person who either doesn't understand the technical uh, effects or the social ramifications. It's almost impossible to get these people to understand those things. And it's really just interesting about that. Yeah. I was explaining that this to a big family dinner I, or lunch I had on Sunday, and I was, you know, they're saying, why can't they just, you know, why can't Apple just let the FBI in? FBI into this one phone. It's like, well, it, it leads to this and this. And so it was, you know, it was yep. interesting to try and explain. And I felt quite intimidated with 18 eyes, 18 pairs of eyes staring at me while I'm trying to explain something that I've only really kind of been casually, passively reading about. And, and what's really funny is I recorded that episode with Ian Buck. And, um, you know, I am not an expert in encryption. I'm not certainly an expert on the law. And I am not nearly as well informed as John Gruber or anyone from the New York Times writing about this. But Mm -hmm. I do my best to attempt to explain whatever it is that I need to explain. And just like you, I'm also a somewhat casual observer. And this stuff is hard, even for the people who care like we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So imagine how hard it is for the people who don't. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, one more thing I'll have to add about this that I that I thought was kind of interesting is that when I spoke with this with this person who is uh, one of my former professors, uh, she had said uh, the first time we talked, she'd said, um, "Oh, and I, and at basically where where we left off, which is where public opinion was pretty much on the side of um, of the investigators in this on this mm-hmm. case." But then I I talked to this person again a week later, and they said. Um, and they said, wow, you know, I, I really 
have learned a lot more about what was going on since then. And I've kind of come around to the sort of things that you were describing. And I was like, oh, really? That's that's kind of interesting. That is really um, interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they'd said, um, they'd said that they actually read an article that said that um, public opinion was shifting significantly towards supporting Apple, um, which I thought was really interesting. And I don't know if I'd seen... Um, the article to which this person referred because I've, I was hearing much like you guys had just described that. Um, yeah, it was pretty decisively, um, not that. Right. Yeah, I don't know. And I, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of primary caucus time right now. And I was recently reading that, uh, what, uh, Donald Trump won by 20 points in some state when 0.8% more people voted for him. Crazy. Right. Oh, no. And, um, yeah. Similarly, how public perception, but how many people even know this is an issue? Like, how many people even care, right. can even recognize that this is an issue to even be concerned about? Um, how many people just don't, don't even know that Apple versus the FBI is a thing? And right. it's, um, it's, it's really hard to gauge and measure. And I wonder if there's, I guess maybe you could sort of use one of those Google Ngram kind of things, maybe. To yeah. sort of gauge it, it's a really complicated thing. It'd be really interesting to read sort of a journalistic paper on, you know, if somebody was bored. That's true. Somebody, if somebody was bored, or if somebody had a um, public relations themed thesis they needed to write within the next, say, six months. Six months. Yeah, perfect. Mm, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so I Excuse will. Excuse me while I call my thesis advisor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I will say this. Um, and I, I cut this part out of the episode I did with Ian because I tried to make it shorter, mm-hmm. but I guess I don't care about this show's length because it's so good. Um, <laughs> for the final paper I wrote for college, I wrote on the FBI versus Apple, and this is not the same case. I actually wrote about a case in New York with Judge Orberstein or something like that, and basically it was a similar case. It was an encrypted iPhone 5c and um the guy had admitted guilt he was charged to be guilty case ended but the fbi still wanted to get into his phone even after the case ended and no longer mattered and they wanted to get into his phone because they wanted to see if whatever his phone contained could lead them to others they could charge or something and um Basically, the paper that I wrote, it was about the the moral implications of doing such things uh, in different moral frameworks, such as uh, relativism uh, and others that I don't remember anymore, two weeks later. And I guess the point is, it's not as if this is an isolated incident. And surely going forward, even if this case goes away for some reason, there will be more issues that come up about encryption versus the government uh, companies or individuals doing things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I'm sure we'll be That's talking sure. about this again on another episode of Podkit. So stay tuned. Oh, yes. Indeed. <laughs> indeed. There will be more. So is it well, Twitter time? I was just going to say, I can uh, take the uh, wheel here with a couple of interesting uh, Twitter folks that um, actually all of these are individuals that I met, uh, individuals or teams that I met at Startup Weekend. Uh, the first being uh, Richard Anderson, who is a local um, iOS developer and uh, I, f- I feel comfortable calling him a serial entrepreneur. He's done a bunch of different uh, kind of cool things, including most recently Tassel. Um, which is an application aimed at the uh, higher ed sector um, that kind of combines a bunch of different um, communication, IT, and student records functions in one app. It's it's uh, pretty slick. I have not uh, seen it yet, but at some point I would like to because uh, Richard's a cool dude, and the way he described it to me sounded really interesting. The uh, splash um, screen looks great. Yeah, I know. It's fancy stuff, right? Pretty fancy. <laughs> Um, yeah. But he's a really kind guy and uh, helped us out quite a bit with our uh, project over Startup Weekend. So great. I want to give him a shout out because he's quite cool. Uh, next is uh, actually the next two folks are uh, two of my collaborators from the project that I was on. Uh, there are more of them, but these are the two that are particularly um, kind of development and user experience focused. Um, so they kind of pertain particularly well to the stuff that we're talking about here. 
uh, Jay, Jay Miles is uh, the designer we worked with, and he is a total, total rock star. Um, it was quite cool to work with him uh, over the weekend. He did a lot of the theming for our webpage, um, and in the sense of the the color scheme, uh, he designed our logo, uh, created a, a an absolutely astonishing amount of like presentation material and like work product that. Um, yeah, we wouldn't have gotten nearly as far without him. Uh, and then uh, my fellow developer, uh, Cody Higdon, um, he uh, was the individual who uh, I worked with to develop the uh, the media web app that I was describing before. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is pretty cool um, and a really awesome developer, really great to work with. Um, his his tweets are kind of interesting too. I think he, he schedules a lot of them because um, one of the things he does is uh, one of the things he built was a tweet scheduling app. So that's kind of cool. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Um, these are, I, I think that's everybody. No, there isn't. Uh, and then finally, yes, I was hoping I was going to get to this one. Uh, the last Twitter follow of the year is not of the year. Oh my gosh. Of this episode. It's getting <laughs> late. Can you tell? Um, is student solve, which is the team that actually won uh, startup weekend. So, um, I forgot to mention that Startup Weekend is kind of a competition. So um, all the teams will pitch a panel of judges, uh, which included a school superintendent, uh, a, a teacher, I believe, a, a school teacher, um, a couple of ed tech entrepreneurs, and uh, of course, Charlie Miller from VidCo, uh, who you might know from around the Twitter sphere. Um, uh, student Solve was uh, an idea that was actually pitched by a bunch of students. You can see kind of pictured in their Twitter banner there. Yep. Um, that kind of was like a Kickstarter that uh, helps students ask for things that they need in the classroom and kind of handle the campaign from start to finish. That's so, great. Yeah. Definitely. Nice. I All think right. that's it I'm, I'm up next. Um, this This episode is pretty much, I decided to go on Twitter. So since the last episode, I followed five. I'll talk about three of them here. Uh, Twitter API, basically info about the Twitter API changes, updates, statuses, whatnot. And then I also followed Jack, who is the one of the founders of Twitter and now CEO again after a while of not again. being CEO. <laughs> yeah. And support, which is Twitter support. Uh, I think they tweet some things about downtimes and changes. I don't know. I think I saw some tweet that came up that someone retweeted. I'm like, ah, all right, I should probably follow that. So, yeah, that's me. Uh, I actually followed somebody recently, uh, and it is, uh, I'm going to totally butcher his name. This is Steve Klabnik. Yeah, that's him. And He's uh, awesome. He is awesome. <laughs> and so the way I know Steve is he is a Rust developer. And I don't mean the kind of developer that uses Rust to develop. I mean the kind of developer that writes the compiler to develop Rust. And uh, I love compilers, okay. by the way. And um, Steve, of course, is uh, the primary author of the uh, Rust tutorial kind of thing. He also wrote um, the Rust for Rubyists which is a really cool guide. Mm-hmm. It's um, really cool because it approaches Rust from a non-systems approach, which is really yeah. um, fantastic because um, I don't write system code a lot. So um, I write PHP, which is like Ruby. Uh, so one of the cool things about this is he favorited, which is, I believe, called a like now. He liked a tweet I wrote from a quote to retweet. So that was pretty cool, and I followed him immediately because that's really cool. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Steve is a really cool guy. I've talked to them a couple of times related to um, some more JavaScripty things. Yeah, but definitely. Yes. He does. Cool. He does a wide variety of things. You can read uh, about it on his um, personal homepage website thing. He does. He know he's a genius, right? Um, I will say that his his Twitter name, not his handle, but his name is hilarious. It's um, Deny Missing Doc. And presumably this is a Rust uh, meta comment that um, will suppress the um, Missing Doc um, compiler catcher thing. So that's fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, Twitter people. Cool. Indeed. So where can we find you all on the internet? Where can we find you, Brandon? Oh, so we're starting with me? Yeah, All we're right. starting with you. 
Sounds good to me. <laughs> well, you can find me uh, on my uh, homepage, which is brandon.mn, which is now complete with uh, an email address that not only uh, exists, but uh, is an email address that's uh, from the domain brandon.mn. So you can email me if you wish to at brandon. No, wait, me at brandon.mn. Once again, that email address is me at brandon.mn. And that is an excellent email address, isn't it? So simple, so easy. Thank you very much. I was much. telling it's someone not... about that today, Brandon, and they were, they were so confused. Because I think I was saying... <laughs> am I emailing I myself? I about, like, Who am I emailing? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Amusing. Uh, well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Amar. And of course, um, on Google+, is that a thing still? <laughs> okay well i think it is you can't find me on peach and that's all that matters perfect well you can find me on twitter at bman4789 and at tech4789 and my website brandon.me which has been touched in a few weeks but i did update it actually somewhat recently last couple weeks just my about page because i try and keep it up to date with my resume and mm-hmm. your so, your yeah, resume so- is full of amazing things so you should definitely go and read that it's not there's there's some things that are a little a little dated on there, but eh. it's fine. Well, this is a great. Uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Sorry, no I have problem. to say I need to update my resume. I haven't touched that thing in like two years. Yeah, but when you put your when you update your resume, it'll be like six pages long. It'd be wonderful. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't be one of those people. I can't be one of those people. But you are I one of those to, people. Eight hundred projects later, you're one of those people. <laughs> you're on like a new project every other week. You know that. Yeah, but some of them are NDA'd, which you didn't hear me say. Well, no, what I'm saying is you, you, you can say that I've worked on over 800 projects in the last 10 months, and then people will say, cool. Okay, all you, right. You can't it. expect that they're actually going to check your GitHub or ask you for info. I mean, that would never happen. That's See, true, Brandon, that's you just need to make a, a projects page that has a little description about every project you've ever done. <laughs> well, and then... Mine, what, mine only has four, which is... Nice to manage. But. And then what you can do <laughs> is on your project page about every project you've ever done, the ones you, you could just like, you know, put a real one, put a real one, and then put one that's all like um, uh, redacted out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, real one, real one, redacted out, redacted out. And that'd be great. That that sounds like a really awesome, uh, a, a really entertaining uh, web project. And I'm look, you've got another project to do. <laughs> Perfect. This very page. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I sh- I should totally like break those out into like micro micro projects like yes. uh like a uh, portfolio redaction feature. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> a new JavaScript I library. Should... Unless I have to redact that too. In oh. Which case... oh. Well, no. Gosh. You already told everybody. Redact. It's over. Yes. <laughs> I am totally. I'm totally going to make that a thing. Re- redact. Oh JS, no! Here goes another, another domain name. That's cool. Redactio. Um, no. <laughs> Brandon, the day .js domains are a thing, you are going to lose so much money. <laughs> I am. I'm going to buy everything. Yeah. Oh my gosh, there already is a thing called Redact.js. Oh my gosh, of course there is. But it's it's a joke, as you might imagine. I imagined. <sighs> unless unless it's not a joke. Maybe it is a joke. I can't tell. Oh my gosh, it's not a joke. Well, okay. That's new. I'm going to add that to the doc. Because that's that's a thing. Must investigate. Wait, this is what I'm thinking of. It's not a simple way for buttery smooth 60 FPS performance. That is it. Is that it? Oh, it's not what I was expecting. Yeah, that's not. It's not what I was expecting. Either. That's not what I wanted. But thanks, Google. I I that's prefer. Something. I I might still make it if only to make a, an actual library that redacts things. Wait, uh, is there a Unicode character that looks like a not an empty box but a full filled in box? Yeah, uh, there's uni- there's there are uni- yeah they're like at least a black square. Yeah, so you could do like R black square black square black square black square T. Exactly. Dot js. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. So well, the, the question is, if I do npm slash oh. redact, does that work? Is is the npm package taken? Because oh no, it is taken. Darn. Gosh dang it. Oh. Well, yeah, I'm just go with like redaction or mm. redacted. Maybe or, no. redact this. 
but but the 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 real value of that pun is in um is in the react js yeah, joke that's what i was thinking so, when i saw that website I, yeah i might it might be worth a, a, a tongue-in-cheek demo at the next javascript minnesota though <laughs> if i make it a thing yeah um, maybe because it, that, that 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 feels like a destroy all software talk of some sort it, right indeed like, it does uh, if I if I wear my snark hat all all day long, I, I bet I could really pull it off. So yeah, you need to be careful I'll... with your snark hat. I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, anyhow, um, this has been a really awesome episode. Yeah, uh, hopefully we'll have another yeah. episode soon. And uh, this has been great. Thanks for coming on again. Yeah, yeah. you bet. Good talking. Yep. Have a good one. <laughs>